Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. This is our last talk for the fall semester. And we'll start up again on January 23rd. So today, we're very happy to um, finish off the series on perspectives on Gawa groups. And our speaker today is Noemi Combe, who will be talking about Grotentiek, Teichmuller avatars, and the absolute Gawa actions. Uh, so, Noemi, is it okay if we record this talk? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Oh, thanks. And uh, everyone, feel free to ask questions uh, during the talk, either in the chat or, or verbally. So, um, Noemi, please get started. So, thanks for inviting, first of all. Um, so, here's a plan of um, what I'll be talking about in this talk. So, I'll just, first of all, um, explain some um, of the state of the art about what's happening with Groth and Dick Miller groups and the absolute Galois group. Um, what are the different perspectives on this um, type of problem? Um, and then uh, I will explain uh, maybe a new point of view and uh, new results uh, that I uh, have been um, working on, uh, which are recent. Um, so, so this is, of course, uh, all based on the collaborations with uh, my mentor and collaborator, who uh, was Yuri Manin, and um, results that I did also uh, by myself. And uh, this um, in includes actually Hervet spaces and Galois extensions, and um, also strongly inspired by Emmy Nother's program um, at the IC. TM in Zurich and uh, about grad and dictation workers. So the plan will be to uh, survey some classical results in growth and dictation theory, the first part of the talk, and then I'll um, move to something uh, that I've been working on and which is related to Emmy Noether's program and um, absolute goal group for rational numbers. So I'll start with the very um, base um introduction to the topic but we never well I've been giving many talks about this in different places and not everyone was famous was um, acquainted with the number theory so um let me say something about this mysterious absolute Galois group uh, Galois over Q so as we know interest in solving arithmetical problems uh, by geometric means is not exactly new because it already goes back to Geophantas of Alexandria. So as you can see, it's like quite a, a while ago. And uh, so our interest in this type of approach um, is still quite actual because nowadays one big long standing problem is to understand this mysterious um, absolute Galois group for rational numbers. So this is the group of automorphisms of the algebraic closure of the field of rational numbers, Q bar, that fix Q. And for people who have never seen this, which I <laughs> doubt here, uh, the definition goes as follows here in the footnote. Right, so uh, this is a, a very important topic, understanding what's happening with this mysterious absolute Galois group. And this has inspired many different paths, and in particular, also flavored by very geometric tools. So some took the path of grothendieck teichmuller theory to consider this absolute Galois group problem, and others, well, chose a piadic number uh, theory and Hodge theory of piadic varieties. So everybody is looking more or less at the same type of problem, but with very different approaches and methods here. So I have chosen uh, this, the point of view of growth and dictation theory. And so I'm going to ex explain what's happening here. So uh, everything starts in the 80s. The growth and dict, the so-called growth and dictation theory starts to take shape in the time. And, um, and so the idea, the key idea proposed by growth and dict is to study the mysterious absolute Galois group via its actions on geometrical topological objects rather than on algebraic numbers. So that's the main philosophy 
um, suggested by Grodin in the 80s. And in particular, Grothendieck noticed that this absolute Galois group acts upon the algebraic fundamental groups of all stacks MGN and the natural maps relating these for various genera G and marked points N, forming what we call, well, a tower, Lego tower. So this is uh, on the right hand side, Grothendieck. Um, I think it was a picture taken while he was exposing EGA, Elements de géométrie algébrique, at the IHES. Um, and in particular, he, going back to Grothendieck Teichmuller theory, he conjectures something very strong that this absolute Galois group coincides with the symmetry group of this perfinite completion here. So this is very strong and still actual as a conjecture. So um, now I'll explain a little bit more what I mean or what was meant by Grothendieck in his, um, in his theory. Um, so we shall consider MGN and the algebraic fundamental group. So for those who don't know, it's a fundamental, fundamental group for a scheme. And it's a, funda a type of fundamental group, but seen through etal homotopy. So a little bit different than the topological one um, in some sense. So uh, the moral here is that the algebraic fundamental group, pi one of, of this object, has an action of absolute Galois group. And so you can see this uh, appearing already in semi de géométrie algébrique, SGA, in this theorem here. So he considers um, a scheme, V, over rational numbers, and he proves that there exists a short exact sequence defined here of profinite topological groups. And this is very important because it induces a homomorphism of the absolute Galois group into the outer, outer, outer the morphism group of this object here. So this short exact sequence is go going to guarantee uh, that we have actually this action of absolute Galois group on this profinite group here. And so everything is based on this. So for those who are not mm, familiar maybe with profinite groups, I have a uh, written short footnote here. Um, so we have G is a perfinite group if it is homomorphic to an inverse limit of finite groups as follows here, where GI are endowed with discrete topology. So everything is based on this. This is a key theorem. And um, so, okay, so now we can discuss a little bit the object MG and bar here. And it has many very interesting arithmetical and geometrical properties. So if we start with the geometry, so we, we know that we have a divisorial stratification of MGN because we have some singularities, we blow them up and we end up with a tree of projective um, lines. And um, from the geometric point of view, there is a question of defining on smooth objects a kind of higher structure algebra, which is called an operet. And this is given by this by these singular degeneracies. So that's one aspect of the story. But arithmetically, this is also very important because we want to determine how absolute Galois group is encoded within the geometric symmetries of MG and bar. And this is precisely what the grothendieck teichmuller theory is about. So it's a very important object for us, MGN bar here. Okay, so uh, now I'll now that I have exposed more or less the um, well define more or less the objects that we were we are going to consider. Um, I will um, start now by explaining the state of the art and what happened and who proved what and what we want to prove nowadays. Um, so let's um, move to a theorem of Drinfeld, which was done in the 90s. 
So in one of the papers of Adrenfeld, he introduced an object that nowadays people call the growth and Nikitaish Miller group and encapsulating the symmetries of our profound completion where the following relation is given. This is very strong. The absolute Galois group injects into this object, which we call growth and Nikitaish Miller group, this profinite group. Okay, the growth and Nikitaish Miller group acts on a wide variety of objects in many different fields of math. And that's very, very interesting that it goes beyond number theory. It's, it appears in deformation theory, for example. It's, it's very, very mysterious. And uh, it's therefore, it remains a very interesting um, topic of research because we don't really understand the structure and how it is really related to different objects. So this remains, uh, well, forms ongoing research. Right, so um, now I'm going to explain um, a bit like a, well, a survey of um, what, what was proved and um, what we would like to do. So we have different shades of uh, growth and dictation group. So let me explain what I mean by this. In particular, so the the first uh, growth and dictation Schmiller group here invented first is the profinite version. So the one that was, um, well, everybody started working on profinite GT. And this appears in Galois theory. And then, appeared another version, the Pro-L version, also very useful in Galois theory, but thirdly appeared another version, which is used rather in homological algebra. And it's another completion called the Pro-Unipotent rather than group. And so this appears rather on the side of um, operads and, and objects of the, that type. So th these are the three different um, versions or completions of GT. And so I would like to say that the conjecture that was outlined by Grothendieck is actually still open. And so the conjecture was that the absolute Galois group and the profinite version of the grothendieck teichmuller group are in bijection. However, what is really interesting is that we can extend this conjecture in some sense to the motivic Galois group and the pro-unipotent growth and dictation group. So we have a kind of similar conjecture on different levels. And here too, we have a conjectural bijection between motivic Galois group and growth and dictation group. And so this is still open actually. And I would like to say that it goes beyond. <laughs> this growth and dictation Schmiller group grow, goes really beyond because it's um, actually at the heart, oops, at the heart of um, other very important and beautiful conjectures, in particular relating multiple zeta values, deformation quantizations, and there's uh, something called a Kashivara Vern group and double shuffle group. It's actually still um, quite open on that side also. And as I was saying, it keeps up, it keeps showing up in very diff different problems. So here's like a short um, summary of, well, some very interesting uh, cases where GT appears. Um, so, well, the first one was um, the Drinfeld paper on quasi hopf algebras, where grothendieck dictationer group appeared as something very important number theory, but also on this quasi hopf algebra side. And uh, other people here, I think of Kajdan, well, they solved the Drinfeld quantization conjecture for Lie by algebras using growth and dictation other theory. But this is not the end. We have still even more different things. So Konsevich Tamarkin, Tamarkin use um, G, GRT as a central object in deformation quantization of Poisson structures. Um, and you can continue like this with 
very different, well, different types of problems. So GT gives solution to a uh, Kashivara variant problem and, and so on. So in particular, in the end, so this was a uh, recent, um, I think 2019, uh, the Lee algebra version of GRT uh, was shown to have actually a strong relation to homologies of conservage graphs, so conservage graphs, periods and deformation quantization. So you see, this is a bit at the heart of different things, which somehow are all related via this GT theory. So um, I wanted just to say that this is a really beautiful um, object to consider. So um so today and this talk I will be more geometric rather than um uh, number theoretical <laughs> um and uh I will talk a little bit about this uh, operatic side of the story um and in particular I think the first person who actually noticed that the operad would be the algebra kind of algebra would be very important in growth and dictation theory was uh Barnaton. that was the the first person so he didn't use the word operand but the thing he was describing was typically a kind of higher structure algebra that we call an operand um so in short what happens what's the relation between growth and dictation groups so that we saw it was well very um something very um well interesting in number theory but apparently this is very related to something very topological such as parenthesized graves and so the story in short is that gt is the automorphism group of a topological operand of parenthesized braids okay and and so what i want to say is that well you can build a tower well i would call this a tower of these parenthesized braids and automorph take the automorphism group, and you will end up having GT. Um, yes, in two words. So, um, so we, and, well, to explain a little bit about this parenthesized braid, so you have um, words of length n. That means you have an alphabet, and you're gonna you're going to create words. Of a given length, and you can add a good, um, well, you can put parentheses in a good way. That means such that, well, it makes sense. And then we connect two parenthesized words by a braid. So this a braid is what the topologists do usually. Um, and, um, and so the operad is a kind of tool that will allow you um, to simplify um, well your your exploration and understanding of this parent size braid in the following way because we just need two things a given morph morphism that I call beta in parenthesized braids of uh, length two so you have uh, length two words that means the word one two goes to one. And you need alpha, another morphism, this time in PB3. So you have words of length three, for example, one, two, three, and one, two, three, but with different brackets. And um, and that's essentially what you need. You just need to know to know that beta exists and that alpha exists. Okay. And well, this is going to be this pair beta alpha is going to be subject to what people call hexagon and pentagon relations so that's more on a categorical level but that's what everything you need is just encoded in this these two morphisms so it's very practical because it's very simple actually um so yes roughly speaking um right so now i could be maybe a bit more rigorous because i wasn't being being very rigorous until now. So the exact statement goes as follows. So for the geometers, an element of the GT uh, growth and dictation group represents an automorphism of the multi of completion of the operand of parenthesis braids. So the theorem is the monoid GT hat is the monoid of endomorphisms of PAB hat fixing these objects, um, base points. So 
to have a picture in mind, you have parenthesized words, you have braids between them, and uh, via alpha and beta relations, you construct every single combination you need. So that's just what it means. Okay, and from the arithmetical side, um, Grothendieck Teichmuller theory provides a finitely presented group, GT hat, that contains this absolute Galois group. And so, therefore, this induces a Galois action on PB hat that is group theoretically defined and from topological origin. And so, um, I find it quite spectacular this mixture of number theory and well, geometry. Okay, um, so avant propos, um, so this is to motivate more or less um, my point of view here. So, um, as I said, I was a collaborative you reminding, and um, what I learned from him among many, many things was the following very interesting comment. So he said, during several last millenniums of development of modern geometry and geometric models of theoretical physics, it was gradually understood that geometry appears on the scene in two different guises, as space or space-time domains and as their symmetries. And um, the idea of symmetry has mathematically crystallized relatively late, arguably simultaneously with Galois' discovery of the role of symmetry in the theory of algebraic equations. Yeah. And revolutions of relativity theory and quantum physics brought with them comparatively fast understanding that space-time models and their symmetries are related by kind of duality. So what I'm working on is on this kind of notion of duality and this re relation to the symmetries of um, Galois. So that's what's motivating uh, my research. And this talk is an, an attempt <laughs> to introduce listeners to this um, kind of perspective um, using the most abstruse contemporary incarnations, well, using algebraic tools. Okay, so these are the papers um, I'm basing on myself for today and also on um, other, well, ongoing paper that I have not cited here yet. Uh, right. So I'll start though. Um, so, right. It is 20. Okay. So I'll explain a little bit uh, more about Grotten Dick Teichmuller group, what is really happening there from a more profinite group point of view. And, and then I'll move on to uh, what I was doing. So something called a modular operand in quantum cohomology, which is actually providing some hidden symmetries, which are, as we have seen, therefore very important um, for understand for a better understanding of growth and Teichmuller group, because everything is based on hidden symmetries of M0 and bar. So first, uh, geometry, geometry with modular operands, and then trying to say something interesting about growth and Teichmuller group. So, um, so why why do we want to do this? Well, the profile GT hat is actually uh, quite hard to handle, and um, so therefore it is useful to use an interaction between what was called quantum cohomology by Konsevich Manin and connections to an object of number theory, which is the absolute Galois group for the level algebraic numbers. So that's the motivation. The GT hat is actually very hard to understand. So the point of view here will be to introduce the avatar of growth. So something likely the classical GT, but it tries to encapsulate some symmetries of M0 and bar and to mimic uh, the, the classical profinite growth and detection group while at the same time um, keeping uh, track of symmetries for M0 and bar, and at the same time, while well, keeping track of the arithmetic data, data behind it. 
So that's the avatar of growth and dictation in the group. Um, so before I start making some avatars of a given object, I'll just recall a little bit what the real object was, the original object was. For uh, the simplest case, that means uh, M04. Huh? So I'll take our uh, scheme. So it's going to be um, this projective line minus three points, zero, one, infinity. And I will consider, so thanks to theorem 6.1 of SGA of uh, Grothendieck, I'll consider the morphism from the absolute Galois group, Galois here, to the outer automorphism group of the etal or algebraic fundamental group of my scheme. That means projective line minus three points. So this the next step is going to be easy. We're going to take the fundamental group or topological fundamental group of this projective line minus three points. And I think that it's always a little bit of a imagination exercise to calculate this. And we can see that, well, the sphere minus three disks is going to end up as a disk minus two disks inside. And so we have actually um, the free group in two generators. Okay, this one, where um, X is a loop around zero and Y is a loop around one. Okay. And so therefore, the algebraic fundamental group is just simply this profinite version, profinite completion of this free group in X and Y. So phi one et al is just this. So I have an illustration here in case, uh, <laughs> in case it's necessary. Uh, so zero, this is one, and you can imagine that there is actually a sphere there. And I'm going to take a loop around zero and a loop around one. And this is uh, the Ling's tangential, um, tangential points. Um, okay, so, um, so we were investigating this Galois, um, this following group morphism where we have Galois mapped to outer automorphism of this uh, group. And we know that it's going to be injective by a theorem of Bailey. Um, so using the Deling tangential base point approach, um, so there's a very nice remark here. So we're going to consider this loop X around zero based at the tangent vector zero one. So that's the Deling tangential base point. And we're going to consider its image, so the image of this loop, using the following map. Z is mapped to one minus Z. And so we can obviously see that the image forms again a loop based on this time on one zero in the fundamental group again. But what interests me a lot is this uh, innocent looking map, rho here, because rho is actually an evolution. So we're going to use some hidden symmetries to reconstitute the big picture. And one of those hidden symmetries will be this, this little map here, Z map to one minus Z, this involution. Um, right, so as I said, we have loops X and loops, uh, well, one loop Y given by this kind of conjugation. Um, right. And this is going to generate this fundamental group by one. Right. Um, and so uh, now we can recall some uh, theorems, for example, one by Drinfeld um, that says that GT hat is in the is contained in the automorphisms of this free perfinite group in two variables and such that for any element of the absolute Galois group that I denote by sigma, we have an automorphism, so from free hat to free hat, such that um, if lambda denotes the image of sigma under the, the cyclotomic character psi, well, we will have um, a kind of relation given here. 
Um, and so in particular, given F, which is in the free group in two variables, so it's a kind of very long word, uh, or just, well, and it's a word. Um, so we have these uh, pentagon, hexagon, and involution relations given as follows. Um, so here I just changed the notation um, using a braid group type of notation. Um, and so we're, ex well, exchanging the strand number i with strand number um, j here. Um, and uh, one of the relations is actually redundant, so you don't need, um, I think the hexagonal relation uh, is not necessary um, to be stated. My theorem of Thoreau. All right. And um, so this relation is quite interesting because you can actually uh, visualize it using braids. So GT had X on the genus zero per finite groups by this formula. So here, um, sigma I is not anymore the cyclotomic character. It just um, expresses um, elementary braids in the art and uh, in the art inversion. So it's just elementary braid. And um, we have a kind of, um, this kind of word here appearing, conjugation. Um, yes. Yeah, so this action extends the Galois action on these groups, which occurs naturally by considering them as a fundamental, as fundamental groups of moduli spaces and using a tangential base points. So it's all, of course, related to the fact that taking fundamental um, um, group for configuration spaces, we find a, a braid group. So that's how everything is related, right? And configuration spaces are tightly related with um, um, moduli spaces of, uh, well, genus, let's say zero for simplicity with mark points. So this all is coming from this fact. And so finally, we can, um, draw a nice um, commutative diagram, which allows us to visualize what's happening actually. So the outer action of the absolute Galois group factors uniquely through GT hat, fitting in the following commutative diagram. So Galois injects into GT hat. And so GT hat has a relation with this outer automorphism group and Galois here also. So that's essentially the three things happening, three objects interacting in this um, theory. Okay, so as I said, I would use a geometric um, point of view this time, so in particular with, with uh, so-called operands, um, and a little bit of categories. Um, so things go as follows. So we have M0 and bar. So you can imagine, for example, a sphere. Well, it's more sophisticated with, than what I'm explaining, but for those who don't work with it, imagine a sphere and you have marked points. And uh, in particular, you have zero, one, and infinity, which are fixed. They cannot move. Um, and so this belongs to a so-called symmetric monoidal category of topological spaces. And um, yes, and so what we call a modular operand is the following. So moduli spaces or, or stacks of stable curves of all genera with a finite number of marked points um, and dealt with natural correspondences between them form what we call a modular operand. Um, so in particular, if you have, so I'll stick to genus zero, and in particular, you can take um, two M0, well, two objects of this type and um, obtain again an object of the same type so that I'm describing what's happening with the operat, um, uh, operation, operatic operation. And we still live in this symmetric monoidal category and still get this kind of object in the end. Um, I'll explain a bit better later. Um, so the very abstract definition, which is my favorite, is the one of Boris of Manin. Um, so an operand over a symmetric monoidal category is a tensor functor 
where gamma is a category of finite graphs with the joint union and morphisms, including graph sets. So um, you choose your favorite symmetric monoidal category A. And he essentially tells you that you have a tensor functor, which is essentially um, saying that you're parametrizing everything by some family of graphs. So for example, it's very uh, common to see uh, trees and everything you do in the operatic operation can be just encoded by like an operation on, on trees and grafting of trees. So very practical and combinatorial <laughs> therefore. Um, so in our cases, we, because I consider just genus zero, I have trees. Um, so, uh, or forests, yeah. And um, the leaves, except for the root, are all numbered from one to n. So if I have m zero n bar, well, the tree underlying this is has leaves labeled from one to n. Um, and when I see grafting, it means that I will connect the root of a tree to a leaf. So I could perhaps make a picture uh, in red. Okay, so let's say that I have something like that. That's my tree. That's the root here. And those are those are those are the leaves. So one, two, three, four, for example. And I would like to, um, so that corresponds to um, abstractly n, <laughs> n. <laughs> and I would like to consider m zero k here. So I would graft it on the side of the combinatorics with, um, for example, I just have three. So this root here, would be connected to one of the leaves I choose. So for example, it could be connected to the third one. And, and so in my operand, I would have that the multiplication is labeled by three because I'm grafting on the third leaf. And I would get something uh, of the size. So N plus K minus one. Okay, so, uh, and, and then I have something in the end which is relabeled. So I have to relabel everyone here. Two, three, four, four. Um, right, I'll erase this maybe. Uh -huh. Nice. And uh, so here I, I wrote the, the rigorous, um, well, al algebraic operation. Um, so this is an algebra, type of algebra. So if I have here um, k marked points for m0 k bar, then I could also um, try to, um, well, consider m0 m1, m0 m2, and etc. And this would give me something of the, which would be m0 n bar, where n is the sum of uh, numbers. So that's an operatic multiplication. So as I was saying, in the end of the day, at the end of the day, we have something like this. So that's called a genus zero modular operator. So it allows essentially to increase the number of marked points while still keeping track of what's happening on the level of the divisor describing uh, M0 MI bar. So that's what I'm saying in this sentence. Structure morphisms, operatic multiplications of genus zero modular operat is given by maps of moduli spaces defined pointwise by gluing of the respective stable curves. So it's essentially, it looks complicated, but it means something really simple. And um, so genus zero modular operat, this type of vocabulary comes from quantum cohomology because a central object is MGN bar, right? So they called it a genus, well, here, zero modular operator, or just modular operator. 
So I'm not going to talk about quantum cohomology because I think it's not the topic of the talk, <laughs> but essentially you need on this uh, cohomology ring to add, add some data, which is in fact involving a notion of Frobenius manifold. And in this data, you have the famous gram of Witten invariance, like the potential function. Um, so I'll just skip this because um, time is flying. Um, so this was a bit of a explanation on what happened on the side of Frobenius manifold, but I will not speak about this. And I would like to comment a little bit on the relation from quantum cohomology to number theory. Um, that the, the step to from one to the other is quite simple if you take etal cohomology, right? So we have a cohomology ring, you take the right one, the etal cohomology, for example. And in that case, the Galois group of algebraic number numbers acts upon all operatic components. So this genus zero modular operat creating thus a connection between um quantum cohomology and number theory. So that's one of the steps that we can we can do here to relate them. Um, so okay, I'm skipping a lot of material because um well a lot of uh, <laughs> slides here because um we don't have that much time. But I would like to talk about hidden symmetries and the avatar of uh Gretchen dictation. So we can go already. So I, I was asked once to do um um, a summary, like very short summary about Amin uh well, work, well, uh, explicitly on something that I particularly liked. And I was just fascinated by the fact that Amin Othar was actually doing some very modern uh, type of mathematics already uh, in 1932. <laughs> So I would just like to cite her sentence because it was really um, striking. So I would say that my project comes my project comes naturally as a continuation of the developments uh, and problems that Emmy Noether outlined in 1932. Um, so in IC, at the ICM in Zurich, she said, first of all, it should be remarked that the main difficulty in obtaining the formulation for general Galois fields lies in the fact that no starting point at all will exist without a hyper-complex method. And hyper-complex method is exactly what I'm going to use. So it's a generalization of complex numbers. So you have tesserines, for example, which are hyper-complex numbers. And uh, she continues as follows. I would at the same time like to explain the application of the non-commutative ideas to commutative ones. One seeks to arrive at invariant and simple formulation of the known facts regarding quadratic forms or cyclic fields by means of the theory of algebras. That means those formulations that depend upon only the structural properties of algebras. Once one has verified those invariant formulations, and that will be in the case, uh, in the examples that were, were given above, one will have then obtain an adaptation of those facts to arbitrary Galois fields and doing so. So I found it remarkably uh, related to what I was doing. So that's why I wanted to cite absolutely her. Um, right, and so how uh, will I proceed now? So the story is that as I have outlined in a given slide, there was this Deling approach and the Ling and the Hara were using this involution which uh, was mapping z to 1 minus d and so that's the kind of top of the iceberg so um, in particular what I want to do here is that um, I'll be using the Deling and Hara involution and uh, kind of enrich it and in the end it will lead to an object that was for some reason, <laughs> studied in for in some papers of mathematical physics, so in quantum theory and relativity theory, general relativity. Um, but so the idea was uh, to go really in the in in the in the type of ideas and thoughts of Emmy Noether by using hypercomplex method. 
for Galois, absolute Galois groups. Right, so um, I will not explain this here, but um, there is a notion of split quaternion algebra. So it's going to belong to the hyper complex type of numbers. So here I, I wrote down <laughs> the multiplication table for this type of, of algebra. It's a split algebra, and um, which is known as composite normed algebra also. And so I'm going to uh, consider now M0 and bar equipped with this kind of symmetries. So I'm going to um, consider um, not the module over this type of algebra, but a realization of this modular uh, object I'm considering over uh, hypercomplex numbers. Right. Um, and so um, I will skip this. So in case you want to see the exact details and definitions of composition algebras, it's all written in the slides. If you need an example of split algebra, there is a very nice one here. So that's for real numbers. Uh, split algebra two locus. So you have two idempotents. So you can write it either in the following way, which looks like a complex number, but so that's why we call it a split complex algebra and not a complex algebra. Or you can consider it as generated by a pair of idempotents, which are um, which both uh, divide zero and are different from zero. So which are both zero divisors. So that's a bit, uh, well, it's a funny kind of uh, situation that we're investigating now. So this is all, if you need to, to uh, read about this, well, it's all in the slides. Um, and now I'll move on to um, some of my results. Right, uh, so this is DM stacks. Again, this is all written in Yuri Manin's book on Fabinius uh, manifolds and uh, quantum cohomology. And so this is how it looks when you equip M0N bar with some kind of hidden symmetry, which is coming from this Delinihara uh, approach. So here, uh, it's we're starting here um, by developing um, all the uh, technical tools that allow us to use a categorical point of view. So here I'm proving that, well, when I equip uh, this kind of uh, M0S or N bar with this symmetry, well, then this resulting object is a groupoid. So this is a little bit technical, but in the end, we managed to have an avatar of graph indentation. And we even have a so-called gravity operand. Maybe I'll skip this part because I think that the audience is more interested in number theory. Um, all right. And, uh, and I don't have much time either. So here, this part is going to be a little bit categ categorical and um, allow to show the existence of growth and Schmiller avatar. So we have natural numbers, we consider a subset and we call it cofinite if its complement is finite. Now, if we have um, a map F, we call it cofinite map or CF map if it's identical on an appropriate cofinite set. And this may depend on F. So well, that's like a little object here we introduced. Now we want to uh, see how it works. And so we can prove that the composition of two cofinite maps is a cofinite map. And bijective cofinite maps form a group with respect to composition. And so we will denote the latter by S infinity. So that's a permutation group with, like, we will see what it means. <laughs> So S infinity coincides actually with this union of SNs where uh, SN is a symmetric group. Okay. Um, 
All right. So S infinity acts upon the family of operatic components of M0 and bar. And um, yeah, this family of automorphisms can be naturally and uniquely extended to the family of all operatic compositions between components. So this is a little bit technical. That is true. Um, I will skip a bit of things. Um, yeah, and so this is the description of, of an M0 and bar. Like for any element of the SN, we produce from it another family, sigma inverse, which is in fact, so the idea is quite simple. We just renumber the sections. So we have these marked points which correspond to those sections and well, we can renumber the sections, right? And so by universality, we obtain for an appropriate automorphism, sigma n, that the same renumbering can be obtained via uh, the pullback of sigma. Right. So the map Sn into automorphisms of M0 and bar is surjective for all n greater than 3 and bijective for n greater than 5. OK. So, um, so this is categorical. I think I have many slides <laughs> which follow. So we have a notion of thin category, and um, yes. So we will continue. Um, yeah, and then we have a posted in grouplets. So for any object X is a full subcategory. Uh, PG, posted in group is consisting of all objects isomorphic to X is a group -led. So this is like categorical technicalities, I would just say, in that way. Right. So now we're approaching towards uh, defining this uh, grossman dictationary avatar. And so the following notations are important. So and thick N is going to be the set of uh, N elements. And we're going to define M is smaller than F and if and only if M is a subset of it. And this forms what we call a thin category. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so now we're motivated by the following, which is producing another infinite permutation group, a modified gross and Schmiller group, which will be a combinatorial version of the profinite gross and Schmiller group. Um, and so we do that by uh, showing how to include groupoids of finite sets into a different poset of groupoids. So that's now the construction of the avatar. Um, Right, so the, the key uh, step here is to consider HOM of MN, and this consists of all cofinite maps obtained by pre-composition of a permutation of M, standard embedding of M into N, and then post-composition with a permutation of N. So that's like the, the central thing to do. Okay, this is categorical maybe, um, and now we're going to do the following. Um, right, so we have P and Q, which are different uh, sets. And now if P is smaller than Q, it means P divides Q. So this is related, as I said, to the previous, um, uh, the previous category. And um, now I'll just base everything on the following. So a little reminder is on cyclotomic fields. So consider the field generated by the roots of unity. It is an algebraic number field, which is given by the cyclotomic field here, Q uh, sigma, no, zeta n, where the, zeta n is the exponential of 2 pi i over n. So it's a number field obtained from Q by adjoining a primitive n through a root of an unity. So this field contains all complex n roots of unity. So that's a picture of... Um, the 
polynomial z power six minus one. And these are roots of the integer. Mm -hmm. Um. So why am I saying this? Because actually the avatar of uh, GT will be all related to this cyclotomic uh, fields. So maybe you will see it because I don't have too much time. You will see it in my slides in, in details, how it works, the relation. But mainly we want to consider Z mod and Z. So Z mod N and establish a relation to the group of unity of degree n. Um, so, um, okay, Grattan the avatar. So that's the big picture. <laughs> so GT is, the classical GT I exposed was on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you have the combinatorial version. And so now it's actually uh, very um, combinatorial, I would say. Um, so we have a family of commutative rings, Z mod Q, and we have family of ring homomorphisms. So that's quite natural, I think, still. For each pair of natural numbers, PQ such that P divides Q, okay? So we have one thing, that's one level. And in particular, we could notice that we have transitivity relation. If P divides QR, and which in turn Q, sorry, and R, divides in turn S, then we have the following transitivity uh, relation. Okay. Um, yeah. So now we could define actually a uh, group MGTQ. And it's defined as the subgroup of permutation of Z, Z mod Q. Generating generated by the following maps. So multiplications by elements of D and Z mod Q star. And we have this kind of special involution that we already saw. A is mapped to one minus A. So uh, as a comment, we can notice an MGTQ is not commutative. And so now we're going to construct this kind of tower of modified Grossman equation groups. And uh, this proposition serves to say that, well, there exists a well-defined group homomorphism that allows me to go from modified grottan dictational group indexed by Q to MGT indexed by P. And that I have also transitivity on this level, MGTQ and towards MGTP. In case P divides it's Q and R divides S, right? We have this kind of similar situation. And so now what I can say is that there exists a well-defined, modified, profinite Grattan dictational group, which is the projective limit of groups MGTQ um, with respect to the homomorphism UQP. So this is how we build Grattan dictational group. And um, it is related to those cyclotomic fields, but also it incorporates these kind of hyper-complex hidden symmetries which exist on M0 and R. And uh, I think I'm very punctual today, so <laughs> many thanks for um, listening. Thanks so much, Naomi. Um, that was really a lot of interesting perspectives there. So um, um, so I'd like to open up the floor now for questions. Does anyone have a question? There's maybe a lot of um, <laughs> topics. Well, maybe I could start with one. Uh, so you, know, you talked a lot about the, the moduli spaces M0N, and um, I'm wondering whether anyone has worked with operads for different values of the genus or for varying G? Yes, so in fact, okay, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, so of course people have done MG and bar, um, someone in operatics, uh, operator for MG and bar, 
uh, but the MGN bar has a bit of, um, I think for genus two, or maybe it was just genus one, it was just a bit different. So it was behaving a bit differently in a specific case, I think, and it, it was a bit of an issue mm -hmm. as far as I understood. So for genus one, I think there was something weird happening. Um, but then MGN bar operat exists. And it's not, I think, indexed anymore by trees. We have to be careful to do that. All right. It's not straightforward. And could you say a little more about the the unipotent GT and how it is different from the the standard one? Mm. Um, so this is a question of a completion. Um, so for the profinite version, well, you take a profinite completion, the pro unipotent one, well, there's more of a homological algebra kind of approach, um, which is different from profinite. So it's just a question of limit, in fact, the kind of limit we want to choose. Oh, thank you.